Uh, so our first speaker today is John O'Regan. John is uh, regional leader in Ireland uh, of all of uh, ACOM's disciplines associated with buildings and places. Uh, John leads, uh, heads up a team of 100 consultants delivering projects nationally from uh, ACOM's offices in Dublin, Galway, Limerick and Cork. Uh, as a Chartered Quantity Surveyor and Project Manager, uh, his experience ranges from commercial buildings for FDI clients, large-scale public sector and uh, public-private partnership projects. John's specialist skills include establishing the appropriate conditions for project success and early strategic cost and procurement advice. Uh, as conference regulars will know, John normally provides a very detailed uh, analysis of the wider construction sector to open our conference each year. Uh, today he'll also he'll cover some of that, but also take a, a slightly different tack. Uh, so those of you familiar with ACOM's an annual review, uh, this year the review is actually taking uh, a longer term view. Uh, so it's considering the prominent challenges facing the construction industry for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, I note in 20 years' time uh, that the students sitting here today uh, mostly be in their 40s and uh, are going to be the leaders of the uh, industry. Um, what me and John will be doing in 20 years' time is not exactly clear, but uh, uh, good luck to the students anyway. Uh, so we'll invite John to uh, come forward and uh, give you his thoughts. Thanks, John. Thanks, Martin. And, uh, yeah, hopefully the students will be paying mine and Martin's pensions in the 20th century. Is there a zapper knocking around here somewhere? So look, um, thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you, GMIT, again for for hosting this this fantastic event. It, it's great to be here. It's great to be here at a time which is um, very positive for the Irish construction industry. Uh, it's a very good time for for the students that are in this room and the students that are in the overflow room, if they're out there. I don't know. The um, you're going to be coming out into an industry that is very vibrant. The opportunities are going to be great. Um, there are certainly more jobs out there than there have been uh, in any of the last few years. You may not get exactly what you want, exactly where you want, but uh, there are certainly great opportunities out there. But I know you have uh, challenges as well. You have lecturers like Martin expecting you to turn up at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday morning when you've got a dissertation due in, in a few weeks probably, so thank you for coming as well. Um, the, uh, well, as Martin said, we publish this document, our annual review of the Irish construction industry, every year at about this time, um, and, uh, and this is our, our West of Ireland launch for this document. This year, we've, uh, we've taken a different approach as well, and there's a digital platform too for it. Uh, so if you go on to ireland.acom.com, you'll, you'll find the document and some other good stuff on that, that, and we'll be adding to that as the year goes on. So, as always, the review looks at the Irish construction industry. It looks at it now. Uh, but, as Martin said, we are taking a different view this year, and we're taking a longer view. We're looking at the longer term and how, in the longer term, the built environment can have a, a positive impact uh, on all our lives and how we can contribute to that. So, firstly, though, I will get into um, the construction industry as it is now. So... 2018 was a very positive year for the Irish construction industry. By our estimation, construction output grew by 17.6, around 18% by value, to around 20 billion. Tender prices, on average, we think went up by around 6.5%. So when you look at that as construction output <coughs> increased by volume, that's an 11 12% increase uh, in volume from the construction output. So that's a, that's a big jump. So where has that happened? Well, it has happened across all regions. It has happened across all sectors of our industry. But there's no question that certainly a high proportion of it has been in Dublin. Uh, the, the, the most uh, powerful uh, sectors over the last 12 months have been the commercial office sector, particularly in central, in central Dublin, and foreign direct investment, um, international companies investing in medtech, tech, pharma, those areas. Um, so that's 2018. 
Looking on then to 2019, the year, we're, the year we're in now, the year we're starting, we've reviewed the, the projects that are on site, we've reviewed the projects that are going through the planning process, uh, the statistics that are out there in certain sectors in terms of housing starts and so on, the public sector capital programme, and we believe that 2019 uh, is going to show an even higher level of growth than 2018, a 20% increase by value to 24 billion, which when you take into account tender price inflation, and again we're, we're looking at significant tender price inflation, is, going, is likely to uh, show again growth in output by volume in excess of 10%. So again, that's a very positive outcome for the industry. Where's that happening again? Well, I think you have to be honest and, and say that a significant part of that is still very Dublin focused. <coughs> And you, and you try and put some statistics on how, um, how the regional spread of construction output is, and the, the simplest, uh, most tangible way of measuring it is sometimes tower cranes. So we have offices in Galway, Limerick, Cork, and Dublin. The Irish Times do a, cr a, tra a, a crane count uh, in central Dublin, and we do our own crane count uh, in the re other regional centres. At the moment, there are six tower cranes in Cork, Central Cork. Does that sound right to you, Pat? There, there are in Limerick, the, the crane that was on International Gardens has come down now. That was a Rathcans project that's finished. Um, so there are now no tower cranes uh, in Central Limerick. And in Galway, we have one tower crane at the moment, which is the one on the Fair Green student accommodation. Now, there are projects starting up, and I'm hoping that that will change significantly. But that's a fair... Um, that's a fair reflection of where it is now. So seven tower cranes in those three regional centres and the Irish Times uh, count for February had 121 cranes in, in central Dublin. So that's an enormous disparity. So that's, uh, that's kind of taking a look at the industry as it is and as it might be over the next 12 months. We are focused on taking the, the longer view uh, and fortunately we have a government at the moment which has a long-term plan, which is fantastic because there hasn't been this sort of strategic plan for a number of years. Pat is going to talk in a little bit more detail about the, uh, the 2040 plan, but this is the, uh, the, uh, the national planning framework for the whole country taking it through to 2040. And there are 10 strategic objectives of that plan, and you can, you can, see, them, you can see them up there on the screen. I'm not going to go through them all, but I think if you look at them, there, um, there's nothing there that anybody in this room could, could probably say, well, that shouldn't be there. They're all very important things. Sustainable mobility, um, access to ch quality childcare, education, and health services, they are all the aspirations that we all should be um, looking for, and that's what the plan is focused on. When you get into a bit more, uh, a bit more detail in the re into, into the figures behind the 2040 plan, it becomes quite... Uh, quite dramatic. So we're talking about a million increase in population. That's a 20% increase in population over that period to 2040, 22-year uh, period. 600,000 new jobs, 500,000 new homes. Um, and when you look at where the target is for that population growth, the target is for it to be, have a, a better regional spread. So 75% of it outside of Dublin. Uh, and 50% in the cities. And I think that is a, a, an important thing that we need to think about, is that urbanisation is a global trend. We, uh, for us to invest in infrastructure and to get the best return on it, it does have to be uh, focused around um, urban growth. So that's, uh, that's kind of the headlines. But then when you get to the next level of nitty-gritty, the, uh, the public sector capital programme is the, the government planned expenditure to, uh, to assist in delivering this, um, this national planning framework. Uh, and figures are published up to 2027. So again, this period uh, in, it does show significant growth. And if you look at 2019, it's a 19% increase in capital spending that's targeted for, for this year. So it's, uh, it's, it, there, is a, there is a plan there too. So bring it down to uh, a, bit, a bit closer to home and talking about these five metropolitan areas that are focused for growth. 
This is the Galway metropolitan area that is identified. It takes in the city. To the west, it takes in Barna. To the north, it takes in Clare Galway, and more and more to the east. The population in that area at the moment is around 80,000, and the target is to grow that by a minimum of 50% to 120,000. So that's, and that's a similar target in Limerick, Cork, and Waterford. So they're pretty ambitious plans when you think about them. And you say, well, look, how are we going to, how are we going to do that in Galway in that period? Well, when you look at the amount of development opportunities that there are around Galway, they're pretty significant. You have Bonham Quay, which you're going to hear more about later. When you look around here, you've got the Corrib Great Southern next door. You've got Dawn Derry's just over the road. You've got the Galwegian site. You go down the road a bit further, you've got the Crown site. There's a lot of development sites in Nocnacara. You go further out to the IDA uh, sites in Parkmoor and Oranmore. There's the Ardorn Corridor, a big new development area outside the Galway Clinic. So there is, um, there is plenty of scope to develop within, uh, within that metropolitan area. So when you think of all those development sites, you might think, wow, look, we're going to be one big building site this time next year. But I just want to give a, a real example to show how, how it does take time and how challenging it can be uh, to get projects moving. So it, we did this study for NUI Galway in June 2014. Yes, it was June 2014. It was strongly recognised that, that there was a shortage of new purpose-built student accommodation in Galway. It still is. So we did this study. It was a very open study at the time. The university recognised that new student accommodation was needed. Um, they, weren't, they were very open to whether it was going to be delivered by themselves or by the private sector, but the important thing that it was that it would be delivered. So there was a very open market soundings with all the active private student accommodation develop, developers in Ireland. They were all invited into NUI Galway. Um, and information was shared with them. A lot of them became very interested uh, in investing and developing in Galway um, and have bought sites and, and things are starting shortly. But that was June 2014. The university made the decision that they, they needed to get things going and that they would start developing their own student accommodation. So this is the Goldcrest Student Village, um, which was completed and opened last September. Uh, we were the ACOM with the project and cost managers on it. So that was 430 beds opened last September. So it took four years for the university to get 430 beds uh, in place from when they first started thinking about it. In that period, there, haven't, there hasn't been any new private sector student accommodation, new build uh, that's, that's uh, been built in the same period. Uh, there have been some upgrades and some refurbs and there are some that are starting now, but there are no new beds that have been delivered. So that's just an indication that when you get down to the reality of delivering things, it does, it does take time. So as I said, we are, we're, taking, we're taking the long view, uh, and you'll see in this document we've we flagged a number of areas that we see as important to the built environment uh, over the next number of years. And so there are articles on the future, our future cities, energy use in the water industry, uh, aviation projects and how to deliver them with collaborative teams, data centres and how to get them going, very relevant for this part of the country, um, and then improving infrastructure resilience. So those are some of the areas that you can pick up in this and we've hard copies outside. Um, but we're not the only people uh, looking at the future and, and things are changing quite fast. So I'm going to look at another couple of things here. So people recognize who, who this fellow is. This is, uh, this, is um, this is Blind Boy from the Rubber Bandits. He does a podcast every week. And he did one a couple of weeks ago, which was about uh, how films predict the future and how accurate they can be. So he was saying that one of his favorite films is, uh, is Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, which came out in 1982. So Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, is set in 2019, this year. So that was, uh, so he was reflecting on what that world, imaginary world uh, of 2019 was like. And it had flying cars and all sorts of exciting things. So his reflection was that, well, 
didn't hit the mark very accurately there. But if you bring that to where we, where we are and where we might be over the next few years, there are um, interesting things going on. So this, this vehicle is certainly not as sexy as Harrison Ford's uh, flying car. This is a, an autonomous vehicle that's been developed on uh, a program called Capri, which ACOM are involved in, in the UK. Um, and I just want to show a quick video about the impact that changes and autonomous vehicles could have on our, on our cities over the next while. Our city has grown up pretty much like all the other cities and it constantly changes. We become more people, the city grows, we build houses, more roads and parking lots, more vehicles. But human beings also need space. So what would happen if we drive away the cars of today and start using autonomous cars instead? Autonomous cars don't need any signs. And autonomous cars need less space, enabling the wider sidewalks. It creates more space for us humans. And autonomous cars can drive and park themselves somewhere else. Look at this commuter station. You will be picked up as soon as you leave the train because autonomous cars know when you arrive. So this reduces waiting times, less pressure, less stress. Autonomous cars will take you all the way home. Look at this shopping mall. It's just a lot of parking lots. We would not need all of them anymore. We could do something funny. We could have a snowy mountain here. It could be a park instead with an outdoor swimming pool and a cinema. This is a place to live in. So with autonomous cars, more space is created around the needs of people. Cities become nicer and more beautiful. Streets become safer, travel smoother, less noisy, more space for life. Well, it will be better. So those of us who do the Galway commute, I think we'll all probably uh, welcome some of the things in there. But I think that is, um, that's, uh, that's giving, a, uh, giving the impression of how things may change over the years ahead. And that may seem somewhat fanciful, but right now, Google, Tesla, all the German car manufacturers, all of them are investing heavily in this. And the current estimates are that by 2030, 30% of all new cars that are being sold will have uh, the capability to drive fully autonomously. So that's, that's massive changes we're going to see over this period. And the, the Cork to Limerick Road, my understanding is that that is going to be designed uh, to be future-proof to deal with autonomous vehicles uh, as they come. So that so so Blade Runner was one of the uh, was one of the, pro the films that Blind Boy was talking about. The other one that he talked about was Big, which was a Tom Hanks film in uh, 1988. So what Big was about, and this was this was a uh, so Blind Boy's theory was that Big was actually a better predictor of the future than Blade Runner, and his theory was that. Big was the story of a 12-year-old boy uh, that takes on the body of a 30-year-old, a 30-year-old Tom Hanks. 
So he gets a job with a toy manufacturer. Uh, he hates the stuffy work environment. He's got his childlike innocence, enthusiasm. Uh, he gets to be great friends with the boss of the, the toy manufacturer, and they decide to change the whole workplace into a, a fun environment. So that was what, that's what happened in Big, and that is a picture of the Google headquarters uh, in Dublin. So again, so the Blind Boy's theory as well, that was a more accurate prediction of the future than, uh, than Blade Runner was. But I suppose the point is, again, things are changing rapidly. Things are changing very fast. Our workplaces are changing rapidly, uh, and construction sites, the way construction is done, will change rapidly. So it's a, working is now much more about how you get work done, how you get it done in a lean, efficient way, how you get it done in an innovative way. It's not about the office that you go into, the desk that you sit in, that you punch the clock from nine to five. And certainly that's being recognized in a lot of companies. And in, and in ACOM, we have a philosophy which is called freedom to grow. Uh, and that is a very open approach to have the best way of getting all work done. So the, the, the principle that we apply is that if it works for you, if it works for your team, the people that you're working with, and very importantly, it works for your client, you're delivering better for your client, then it works for everybody and it certainly works for us. So that means people are working more from home, working different hours, and encouraged to work in different ways. So again, the, the, life, the working environment that the students here are going into and going to be in in the next 22 years to 2040 will be changing dramatically, I think. So let me find the zapper again. So coming back to uh, the long view, in the preparation of our annual review, we did a, an industry survey. And what we looked at were what people saw as the, the principal challenges to delivering uh, 2040 in the long view. So the skills and talent shortage, lack of public funding, political upheaval were uh, some of the key ones. And this survey was done last November. Um, so Brexit wasn't quite as focused in everybody's minds there. So you might find that that 27% is higher now. Uh, and I think that skill shortage is more acute as well. We also talked to people about how prepared they thought that our industry was to deliver 2040 and the, the complex projects that are out there. So again, skills shortage was out there. Um, and the bottom one there, delivering complex multi-partner projects at pace. There are some really exciting and important projects in the 2040 program. Uh, and I think it's a bit worrying that only 35% of our industry thinks that we're prepared uh, to deliver those sorts of complex projects. So those are a couple of things to think about. So I'm going to conclude by coming back to a construction output and thoughts about construction output. This is um, construction output over the last 22 years, from 1996 up to 2018. So uh, it's also the story of my life. This is the, uh, this is the uh, I moved to Ireland in 95, so that roller coaster is the, the roller coaster I went on and the industry went on uh, over that period. If you take the average growth in that period, uh, it's 4% per annum. And if you were to project that forward to 2040, we'd be at around 50 billion construction output um, by 2040. So I think that's actually quite a modest uh, estimation. I think it's going to be significantly higher than that if we're going to achieve that million growth in population. Um, but life isn't that simple. It's not going to be a straight line, I'm sure. Uh, it could, could happen like this, this amber chart, uh, slow to start, then accelerating at the end could happen like this, uh, like this purple line, which shows accelerated growth, continued fast growth now, and then leveling off. More likely, though, it will be uh, an up and down, as it has been. There are the, uh, our industry does work in cycles, and I'd like to just flag three risks that, that we see in terms of uh, continued growth in our industry and our economy. Uh, the first is Brexit. We don't need to talk about that anymore. Everybody knows about that. The second is um, foreign direct investment. We have a fantastic track record in Ireland through the IDA and other bodies of bringing uh, foreign direct investment, particularly American investment, uh, to Ireland. We've also a great record of keeping it and changing with it and allowing uh, foreign direct investment to grow in Ireland. Um, 
but we are quite dependent on it. So if there are hiccups in that, there will be challenges for us. And the third area I just wanted to flag was just the general European economy. Ireland has been the fastest growing economy in Europe for the last five years, um, but things are not as rosy in Germany, France and Italy. Um, in some ways that's good news for us because it probably means interest rates will stay low. Um, but if, um, if things don't continue, if, continue, if things don't go well for those economies, it's bound to have an impact um, on us. So we in, uh, in ACOM are looking forward to 2019. We're looking forward to working with the people in this room on projects, new projects going into 2014, particularly clients and those the students, I'm afraid you have to do your own projects, but we're looking forward to working with developers and so on. Um, for the students that are there, uh, that period out to 2014 is going to be exciting. Our industry is a, a very dynamic and exciting industry, and I think it's changing faster uh, now than it ever has before. So what I'd say is buckle up and enjoy the roller coaster, uh, and I'll be happy to talk with you all later on. Thank you. <laughs>